Excellencies, colleagues, uh, distinguished panelists, fellow young people, everyone from around the world who are joining us this moment. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I hope you are well and safe and you are taking care of your mental and physical health. Happy fifth anniversary of the UN Security Council Resolution 2250. What a great day for all of us young peace builders. Looking back at the achievements five years ago and the journey so far and where we are headed from this point on. My name is Jatma Vikramanayaka and I am the UN Secretary General's Envoy on Youth. It is my absolute pleasure and privilege to be co-hosting today's event with the government of Sweden. At the outset, let me also thank the permanent missions of the UN uh, to the UN of Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, the Dominican Republic, France, as well as our UN partners, UNFPA, DPPA, and UNDP for their support in making this event happen. Today, we will be taking stock of the key youth peace and security milestones, reflecting on how the youth peace and security agenda has been implemented and glancing into the future operationalization of this very important agenda that is close to all of our hearts. To officially start the celebration, I'm honored to introduce the Swedish Minister for Foreign Affairs, Her Excellency Anne Linde, to deliver the welcoming remarks. Dear Excellencies, distinguished participants, colleagues and friends, it's an honor to welcome you to this event celebrating five years of the first Security Council Resolution on Youth, Peace and Security. I'm proud to do this together with the UN Secretary General's Envoy on Youth and in close partnership with the Dominican Republic, Jordan, France, UNFPA, UNDP and DPPA. The anniversary is a valuable opportunity to assess progress and lessons learned. We see increased engagement of young peace builders and youth leaders in frontline humanitarian and conflict resolution efforts in all parts of the world. Despite this, opportunities for real participation remains inadequate. We therefore need to turn words and commitments into action. It is impossible to think into the future of tomorrow's world without listening to and involving young women and men. The UN 75 Declaration, adopted in September as the organization celebrated its 75th anniversary, notes that youth is the missing piece for peace and development. It underscores the importance of meaningful and effective engagement with youth. It's our responsibility to ensure that we translate those ambitions into action. Young women and men have repeatedly shown that they are a force for peace and democracy to be reckoned with, in Yemen, Sudan and Belarus to mention a few. Sweden, through its development cooperation, supports innovative ways to fund locally driven initiatives by young peace builders. We would like to encourage other member states to join us and support youth led peace building initiatives through core support in order to ensure sustainability and flexibility. Sweden welcomes the UN's and the UN Security Council's continuous efforts to advance the youth, peace and security agenda. A strong normative framework has emerged. Sweden took a leading role in this during our tenure in the Security Council when the Progress Study and the UN Security Council Resolution 2419 was adopted. However, there is still much to do when it comes to implementation. One example of how Sweden support this is through funding youth-led peace-building networks. These networks provide space for young peace builders' voices and facilitate the connection between local initiative and global policy making. In the same way as meaningful participation of youth is critical, it is key that a youth perspective is mainstreamed into action at country level. As a contribution to the effective operationalization of the agenda, Sweden, through the government agency, the Folke Bernadotte Academy, has produced a handbook for youth, peace and security advisors and contributed to the joint UN-FBA handbook on YPS programming. Both handbooks will be launched at today's event. 
Sweden stands firm in its support for the continued implementation of the youth peace and security agenda. Sustained progress requires political commitment, resources and leadership from us all. Let me conclude by mentioning one of my main priorities next year. During 2021, I will be sharing the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, OSCE. By my side, I will have a special representative of the OSCE chairpersonship in office on youth and security. I'm happy to introduce Rosalind Marbina, the chair of the National Council for Sweden's Youth Organization. Her engagement in the OSCE work is yet another testament on the important role of youth in matters relating to peace and security. I wish you constructive and productive discussions today and look forward to learning and drawing inspiration from your knowledge and expertise. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister, for that video message and congratulations for chairing the OSCE and bringing youth voices into your chairmanship. And now I would like to welcome our distinguished keynote speaker, uh, the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Amina Mohammed. The DSG does not need any more introduction, so over to you, DSG. Thank you very much, Jayasma. Um, excellencies, colleagues, and many friends um, who join us today. I'd like to thank the government of Sweden and the Secretary General's envoy for use on convening this event in collaboration with UN partner agencies and governments of the Dominican Republic, France, and Jordan. Today marks the fifth anniversary of the adoption of Resolution 2250 on Youth, Peace, and Security by the UN Security Council. And you have all been true champions on this agenda. Resolution 2250 gave long overdue recognition to the agency and leadership of young people in peace building and provided an opportunity to rethink our approach to working with and for young people. Since its adoption, we've collectively taken steps in the right direction to enable young people to play their essential role in building peaceful and just societies. The UN launched its first ever youth strategy and its focus on young people as catalysts for peace and security is inspired directly by Resolution 2250. Through the independent progress study on youth, peace and security, the missing piece, we have expanded the evidence base on the correlation between investments in young people and dividends for peace. Between 2016 and 2019, the Peace Building Fund invested $57.2 million in youth focus, focused programs through a new gender and youth instrument. We're also seeing the mainstreaming of agenda into 20, 20, 22 special political missions, including through the establishment of 14 youth focal points and in Somalia, a full-time youth advisor. I've seen firsthand on my recent visits to West Africa, how critical meaningful youth engagement is for sustaining peace and how important it is that we work to build trust between young people and institutions underlining the social contract between government and its people. And in particular, I was pleased to see the role that youth are playing and need to play in the transition in Mali. We're also seeing this agenda being advanced by member states and by regional partners, such as the African Union, which adopted a 10 year continental framework on youth peace and security last August. Perhaps most importantly, this international recognition has inspired many more young people to join the ranks of their peers working for lasting peace. From prevention to peace processes, protection to post-conflict reintegration, young people are stepping up through formal and informal mechanisms. And by using traditional enga engagement means, and of course, new technologies, the tool of their time. Despite being the generation that has been most dispor disproportionately affected by COVID-19 lockdown, the climate crisis, unprecedented levels on unemployment and violence, young people are still finding ways to engage, to support each other and to demand and drive change. Dear friends, despite the achievements noted above, the youth peace and security agenda still faces many challenges. And I would like to highlight two areas where I think we can come together and we must improve. First, it is critical to narrow the gap between the pace of normative progress in New York 
and the realities of youth participation at the country level. Many young peace builders tell us that their participation is not welcomed by the public or those in positions of power. And this is especially evident for young women. I call on every member state and every stakeholder who helped to build the normative foundations of this agenda to engage proactively in its successful implementation on the ground. And I would encourage us all increased accountability for implementation for results across the board. And to that end, I would urge everyone to make better use of the UN's convening power to address the barriers to youth participation and to draw on our UN country teams. Building on Security Council Resolution 2535, we will also work to increase the work of UN missions with young people in carrying out our peacekeeping and political mandates. Second, we must increase our investments in youth-led peacebuilding. Too often, funding partners react to the challenges of extremism through investments in counter-terrorism programs rather than prevention, including key areas such as youth participation education, economic opportunities, and protection. And so I would call on funding partners to increase their support for youth-led peace building and to make funding more accessible to self-organized and informal youth movements. Dear colleagues, Resolution 2250 has given us a solid foundation to work with young people in creating a more peaceful world. It can serve as a catalyst towards implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals in those countries experiencing fragility, conflict, and violence. So let us move forward with greater determination to make the best use of opportunities this historic youth peace and security framework has to offer for us all. Thank you. Thank you very much, DSG, for your words of wisdom and the very concrete two recommendations that you provided. I think all of the young peace builders in this virtual room would agree. And we also join you in calling governments and donors to specifically pay attention to the areas that you highlighted. Thank you very much. So now it is time to start our journey of taking stock of the youth peace and security milestones in the past five years. So I invite the audience to join this journey by sharing your key moments on social media by using the hashtags, hashtag youth for peace, hashtag YPS anniversary and hashtag youth lead. Uh, we have partnered with Twitter and Twitter Gov has created a Twitter moment capturing since 2015, the key milestones shared on Twitter, on social media, since the adoption of the council. So you can take a journey down the memory lane. So to join me in reflecting, I would like to welcome our distinguished panel. Please allow me to introduce Her Excellency Seema Bahus, the Ambassador and Permanent Representative of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan to the United Nations. Jordan was one of the leading, actually the leading uh, member states who led us on the adoption of the Resolution 2250 in uh, 2015. Her Excellency Anna Karin Enestrom, Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Sweden to the United Nations, our host today, and also uh, the key, one of the key countries behind Resolution 2490. His Excellency Jose Singer, Ambassador and Special Envoy of the Dominican Republic to the United Nations to the Security Council, Ms. Tiara Dim Labi, Minister Counselor of the Permanent Mission of France. France and Dominican Republic were actually the pen holders of the most recent resolution 2535 of the Security Council. Joining our member state partners today are two civil society and youth representatives, Ms. Joy Godwin, Steering Committee Member of the Nigerian Coalition for Peace and Security, Youth Peace and Security, and Ms. Matilda Fleming, European Affairs and Partnerships Manager of Search for Common Ground and the Advisory Group of Experts for the Progress Study on Youth Peace and Security. I would now like to invite all panelists to join us by turning on their cameras. Um, I also would like you to keep in mind the time restrictions. I will be very tough in keeping time and uh, I hope you will still stay friendly with me if I cut you off during this very tight panel that we have today. Um, I now give the floor to Her Excellency Seema Bahus to take us through, take us down this memory lane uh, into the adoption of the first resolution in 2015. Ambassador, the floor is yours. 
good morning to all the peace builders from around the world or good afternoon or good evening uh, good morning uh, dsg amina and uh, good morning also uh, our good good friend youth envoy jasamaya and i really want uh, to also say good morning uh, to uh, sweden uh, my dear friend Anna Karen, the Dominican Republic, France, and all UN agencies present today and other funds uh, programs who have participated in bringing uh, this event uh, to fruition today. And as you said, uh, dear envoy, dear youth envoy, what a great day. It is really uh, a, an important day and uh, we feel that also the launch of the YP YPS handbook is a crucial step in advancing the YPS agenda, which we all uh, are uh, um, you know, owners of, I, I would say. And uh, let me say that uh, for us, for Jordan, uh, 2250 has been the culmination of efforts of Jordan's uh, unequivocal commitment to the uh, bettering of lives of young women and men, uh, which comprised almost uh, more than 70% of the population. Our belief in young people as active agents of change prompted us to take this vision internationally in 2015 when we were members of the Security Council and uh, president of uh, during that month by proudly uh, being the first country ever to bring the YPS agenda to the United Nations Security Council uh, through resolution 2250. This first resolution was fully dedicated to the important and positive role young women and men can play in the maintenance and promotion of peace and security. For us, this was extremely important, especially uh, from a region that is, uh, you know, um, has a lot of conflicts. Uh, we are a country surrounded by different countries in conflict. We also saw uh, so many refugees throughout the years, and we saw how youth uh, uh, men and women can always be at the front lines of supporting and of uh, of playing uh, an active role, but not as active as we would have ever liked it to see. And we thought that this resolution would bring this uh, role uh, to fruition. On that historic day, the Security Council also, we were proud, was chaired by the youngest chair ever to chair the Security Council. It was His Royal Highness, the Crown Prince of Jordan. This was also another commitment uh, to and for young people and from young people to this uh, to this agenda and i think it was the for the first time we felt that the important and positive contribution of youth uh, in efforts for the maintenance and promotion of peace was uh, recognized of peace and security was recognized uh, internationally and uh, this resolution as you all know i don't want to go through it but it uh, it identified five pillars for action and requested also the progress study uh, on uh, youth's positive contribution to peace processes and conflict resolution. Of course, it was also built upon uh, by uh, uh, Security Council resolutions 2419 and 2535, uh, which also took place after uh, 2015. So five years later, I, would, I think that uh, we have managed to work on institutionalizing, organizing, and developing a youth agenda in Jordan by adopting an ambitious national youth strategy uh, and also by inspiring many youth organizations and youth-led organizations, not, not only in Jordan, but throughout the region and uh, the world to spearhead and pursue active and meaningful youth engagement in peace and security efforts. Uh, one of the very important cornerstones uh, for uh, reaching peace and security is to ensure that the rights of, uh, that the young people have rights, tools and opportunities to participate in a meaningful way. And we fail that we have contributed partly to this. I would stop here, I guess, um, and then we can, uh, we can continue uh, later. Thank you, know. Ambassador. Uh, thank you for you as well. Thank you. I will come back to you again for the next round. And now I give the floor to Her Excellency Anna Karin Enstrom, the Ambassador of Sweden to the United Nations. Thank you so much, uh, Yevma, and and uh, very good morning uh, and good afternoon and good evening wherever you are in in the world. DSG is is great to see you, and colleagues and friends uh, all over the world. And I'm 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 really honored to take over after my my very good friend uh, and dear colleague uh, uh, Sima, uh, and uh, we work closely on this uh, on 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 this agenda. So Yevma, there are several key milestones that have brought the uh, YPS agenda forward 
during these past years. And, and this is really a, a day of celebration, I think, for, for, for all of us. And, and many of these, uh, um, these steps are, of course, thanks to the collective efforts of youth themselves. And I think that needs to be uh, uh, highly acknowledged. They're being engaged in securing and building peace and the support and also supported, of course, by, by UN member states uh, and, and the UN itself. And, and some of the colleagues that have been greatly engaged are with us here uh, today. So one of the primary milestones was, of course, the uh, UN Security Resolution 2250. Uh, and this landmark resolution brought important recognition to youth crucial uh, contribution to peace. It also paved the way for additional milestones, including the reports and resolutions that followed. That said, it is essential that we also take this opportunity to acknowledge all the work that's been done before the adoption of the resolution 2250, especially by youth movements. Youth are committed to concrete peace building efforts, both at the community and national level despite having been excluded from, from formal decision-making uh, fora. Youth have been key in, in the advocacy work and pushing forward the agenda. There would not have been any resolution without the leadership and engagement of young women and men. Indeed, months before the uh, resolution 2250, Young peace builders at the Global Forum on Youth, Peace and Security in Amman had called on the UN, UN Security Council to adopt the resolution on youth, peace and security. This is important to, to bear in mind also as we move forward. It is our efforts to implement and institutionalize the agenda and that they are remain relevant and sustainable. We must ensure that youth representatives are at the center. Similarly, at the local level, we need to ensure that peace building initiatives are identified and driven by youth. Through our development cooperation uh, agency, CIRA, uh, Sweden supports youth led peace building work networks, including the United Nations, uh, sorry, the United Net Network of Young Peace Builders, and there are more than 110 members across the world. It also supports innovative ways to fund locally driven initiatives by young peace builders. Making sure that youth are at the center of our efforts is also key to the work of the Swedish government's agency, Folkebanado Academy. And this is something you will hear about uh, uh, later on uh, in the program when my colleagues, Van Erik Söder, the Director General of the EFBA, will reflect on today's work on WPS. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I now give the floor to His Excellency Jose Singer of the Dominican Republic. Thank you, Jay. And uh, today is a big day for all of us that are so committed to this uh, YPS agenda. And as we mark today the fifth anniversary of the groundbreaking resolution 2250, we have to reflect on the progress made in the last five years and uh, maybe identify the bottlenecks and, and an opportunity to galvanize support towards implementation of our agenda. But it's opportune to continue asking ourselves, where should we go from here? And that was a question asked, uh, the, the Dominican Republic asked itself when we went, uh, when the assuming the, its membership in the Security Council. You know, we were strongly committed and continue to do in supporting the YPS agenda and, and efforts by, made by Jordan, Peru, and Sweden. One of the first things we were clear about is that we needed to bring young people to inform the council, not just on matters pertaining to YPS. So we hope that this practice will be continued which we started uh, through our first open debate in January 2019 on climate and security and continue to do so, so in the future meetings we did organize. Uh, moreover, with the YPS debate organized by the Dominican Republic last April, member states were able to welcome the first report of the Secretary General on YPS and to take stock on progress made regarding implementation share best practices and lessons learned, and discuss the priorities for action. We listen to young 
peace builders from Yemen and South Sudan. However, it has not been just about listening to them, but learning from them and all young peace builders. Definitely the Security Council Resolution 2535 is one of the milestones the Dominican Republic feels very proud about and to have sh shepherded it with France. It reinforces political commitment to the implementation of the YPS agenda, but it also seeks to operationalize these commitments. Of particular importance, how 2535 institutionalizes the YPS agenda in the Security Council and in the UN system aimed at solidifying implementation. With the Secretary General's continuous reporting on YPS, requested by Resolution 2535, we are convinced that we will ensure better implementation and with youth at the forefront. Breaking silos across the Security Council is crucial. Therefore, during our tenure, we have made sure that YPS is at the core of our interventions, initiatives, and efforts. Likewise, we made strides to ensure YPS provisions in peace operations, mandate renewals, but much more is still to be done in this line. Reasons why the Dominican Republic organized last September with the support of France and others an area formal meeting to look at how best to support the YPS implementation by UN missions. We must say that none of these commitments would have translated into action effectively without close collaboration with the UN system, including UJ and your office, and with youth organizations and young peace builders. This collaboration and our coordination are of essence to ensure the accelerated implementation of this YPS agenda. Thank you very Thank you much, you. Ambassador. Let me come back to you for the, uh, the second question in a little bit, but now I'm going to pass the floor to our colleagues from the Mission of France, Ms. Diara Dean Labbé. Bonjour à tout le monde et merci beaucoup d'avoir organisé cette réunion. I would first like to thank our speakers and pay tribute to all young human rights defenders and activists around the world. And allow me to thank the DSG and to quote her because enabling young people to play their role in peace process, but more broadly in all relevant aspect of our society is crucial. We have witnesses uh, recently uh, on environmental issues that we know will have an impact on peace in more part of the world now and in the future. How France has contributed to the advancement of the WPS agenda. As you well know, France is dedicated to the advancement of the WSP agenda. We supported the resolution 2215 and the 2419. We facilitated Resolution 2535 with our friend from Dominican Republic. 2535 builds upon 2215 and 2419 while strengthening the human rights protection framework. This is what it means by the protection of the civic and political space. And all that why? Because youth need their right respected to express their full potential. Young people continue to be victim of stereotype and discrimination. They remain excluded from decision-making processes. They are seen from a perspective of risk to be channeled in state of their potential to be harvested and emphasized. France has also invested in quality education. We have devoted 200 million euro to the Global Partnership for Education for young leaders to emerge we must offer everyone the intellectual and moral tools that only quality education can provide. So we really need to have to take care of them because they are our future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now allow me to give the floor to Ms. Matilda Fleming. Matilda, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and thanks for having me. I wanna to speak to the genuine partnership behind the YPS agenda. Having been in intimately involved in the creation of 2250, I know it would not have come about without young people coming together with 
adult civil society, and then bringing several parts of the UN system and eventually member states on board with the idea. It was a partnership based on equality and on trust. And the process of creating that equality and trust is, if not a milestone, then in any case, an achievement worth celebrating. Someone at one point said that the 2250 partnership worked so well because all egos were left at the door of any meeting. And I think that's something all partnerships within the YPS agenda should learn from, egos at the door. For adult-led organizations, I think we all need to look ourselves in the mirror and ask, are we listening to and acting upon young people's advice, or are we tokenistically involving them when it suits us? I want to give two examples of what equal partnership can look like in 2250 implementation. My first example is Youth360. A search for common ground, we are developing new ways of working with youth as partners and leaders, rather than as beneficiaries. In partnership with UNY Peace Builders, UNAOC, and the UN Peace Building Fund, through Youth360, we provide 500 youth groups with access to funding, technical support, and networks. Young people determine what matters, what should be done about it, and how the resources should be allocated within this program. If anyone wants to know more about this, contact me. I'm on Twitter. That sounds like a very old person thing to say, but you know, Google. Um, my second example is a youth-led fund on youth peace and security that we together with UNY Peace Builders are launching today. We want to meet young people where they are, making funding youth accessible. Today, very little institutional funding is in fact accessible to, young, to youth groups without in-house financial expertise or long track records that they can speak to. Young people will be able to invest in the fund themselves, and we're welcoming partners on board to help us shape this exciting step for the YPS agenda. And finally, if we speak about trust and about partnerships, I think it would be wrong to not mention the fact that young people are increasingly under attack, that youth activism is dangerous, and that the relation between the state and its young people in many places is very difficult. As referenced in the progress study on 2250, The Missing Piece, young people say their own governments are one of the greatest sources of violence. There's a whole lot of trust building that we will need to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matilda, for those very honest reflections. Now I give the floor to Ms. Joy Godwin from the Nigerian Coalition of Youth Peace and Security. Right, um, it's such a delight to be here. Um, as I reflect on how far we've come, I remember um, a quote by um, the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres. Um, he said, and I quote, young people provide a solid foundation on which to build. Their talents are diverse, they yearn to engage, and even those who live in difficult circumstances are generally optimistic. Now, this is exactly the case for an average young female um, peace actor like myself living in Nigeria. We're living through difficult circumstances. So difficult circumstances such as structural and systemic barriers, um, difficult circumstances such as unemployment. The second quarter of this year, um, unemployment has gone up to 34.9% amongst young people. Difficult circumstances such as poverty. Recent statistics shows that 40% of the Nigerian population live under a dollar per day. Difficult circumstances such as exclusion from decision making. You know, but even with all of these issues, um, I think of the fact that this resolution has afforded us a measure of inclusion, what Rita Roy, the president of MasterCard Foundation, calls the dignity of opportunity. I see that it has afforded us a measure of this opportunity. I think of young people like Precious in the southeast of Nigeria and Osime in the southwest, who have their voices heard on issues that affect them and their communities, issues on hunger, poverty, quality education, police brutality, violation of human rights, and so on. I think of young people in the Northeast, like Imran, people like Aberdeen in the North Central. They have further the opportunity to apply their heart, their experiences, their talents, their energy to initiatives that are facilitating peace architecture across communities and preferring solutions to violent extremism and terrorism. I think of young girls and women like Kautumi in the Northwest, 
She stands tall as a leader in her, in her community, advocating against gender-based violence, advocating for equality. I think of young men like Lawal in the Southwest. He is opportune to pull a seat at the table, at the table where policies are designed and formulated, a table where nations are formed and birthed. I think of young people like me, who have had easier access to partner with UN entities and AU in gathering technical support for our teams and the work we do in our country. So we've enjoyed a measure of, of inclusion. However, structural barriers still remain for a lot of young people, right? But for today, for today, we celebrate the degree of opportunity it has afforded us as young people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joy, for those really great reflections also from, from your community and young people in your country doing concrete things to translate these resolutions into, into practice. I want to now go back to Matilda because Matilda was talking about how young people came together and demanded the UN to and this doesn't really happen often you know there are so many stereotypes about young people that they don't really care what's going on in their governments they don't vote they don't know what is in UN resolutions and this is kind of contra this stereotype is contrary to what you were saying before and I want to ask you why did young people advocate for a UN resolution why is it so important for the Security Council to recognize the role of young people Thank you. Yeah, so back in 2012, you know why peace builders brought together what we call the youth advocacy team, consisting of young peace builders from Nigeria, Egypt, Pakistan, Iraq, Colombia, I'm forgetting countries. Um, and the team really early on recognized that young people were generally seen as troublemakers or possibly victims in any policy discussions around peace and security. And all this peace building work that was done by young people was completely unrecognized. We also saw then, and this picture is becoming, I think, increasingly stark today, that chronic crises are becoming generational crises. For 80% of Congolese, their country has been one of the world's worst humanitarian crises for every year of their adult lives. Young people on the front lines are often fighting in wars that are older than they are themselves. So the youth advocacy team wanted an internationally politically binding document that recognizes and addresses the specific needs, assets, and experiences of youth in conflict and post-conflict scenarios. Hmm, easy, easy to do. We had seen UN General Assembly resolutions on youth that included um, good language, but we were most definitely missing action on those words. So we thought, hmm, what's the leading body on peace and security in the world? Well, the Security Council. So that's what we aim for. Um, despite some kind advice from a number of diplomats that uh, thought we were being overambitious or unrealistic. We were convinced that a Security Council resolution would be an empowering tool and a tool for accountability, that it would recognize young people's right and young people's duty to contribute to peace and security. Very much in line with this old saying of, of nothing, nothing about us without us. That's it. Thank you very much, Matilda. So young people for years advocate for this resolution. In 2014, you go to Amman for the Youth Peace and Security, the first global conference. And there you find an ally. You find the government of Jordan, who at that time also hosts a seat in the Security Council, a crown prince who's extremely committed to this agenda. And there comes 2250. So Ambassador Seema Bahus, what was it like for Jordan to take this leadership? And how do you think adopting 2255 years ago has changed the landscape for youth peace and security? Thank you. Uh, thank you. And thank you for all the speakers. Uh, it has been uh, quite inspiring to hear and to go down memory lane. I think, um, yeah, the, the, the Amman meeting uh, in 2014 was kind of the spearhead for what, uh, what we felt and what the world felt and what the youth felt most importantly uh, needs to be done for youth and, and for the involvement of youth in peace and security. 
also the, the what was happening in the world and maybe still happening the issues of violent extremism the issues of terrorism the issues of uh, of uh, also uh, insecurity about jobs insecurity about education insecurity about development for many of uh, of the youth in our part of the world but also in different parts of the world that were uh, suffering from conflict and from uh, lack of peace and lack of security all this uh, with the with the force of the youth brought together uh, uh, the thoughts uh, as was mentioned by Matilda to bring to go to the Security Council and uh, to do uh, and to to work hard on presenting this 2250 and the, the YPS agenda. I think it was important also to see the political commitment at the highest level, not only from Jordan, it came from Jordan. Uh, from His Majesty, from the Crown Prince, uh, and many other youth organizations there, but also all those who attended the Amman meeting had the same uh, political commitment uh, from their governments, from their youth-led organizations, which is uh, which is extremely uh, extremely important. I think another issue was uh, the the positive change that was being affected, uh, inching into positive change towards youth was also extremely important for that. And to see that uh, youth, uh, young uh, women and men, if given the space, when given the opportunity and provide, uh, provided with the support, that they can move the needle forward and that they can be uh, involved and that they also have the energy the expertise even about their own situation that they can move forward. We felt that encouraging uh, young people to proactively take part in the process, I hate to use the word encouraging and so on, but investing in the investing in the agency of young people was important for Jordan. And I think for everyone who attended uh, different meetings on, on the issue of, uh, of uh, youth uh, uh, agenda. But we also felt that um, there was, uh, mindsets were being changed from looking uh, at youth as troublemakers, uh, looking at youth as maybe victims, looking at youth as no, for having no place in society as a burden. All of a sudden, there was, there was this engagement, this participation that showed that there is a lot there to be invested in, to be uh, the agency there can be uh, fruitfully used for uh, peace and security in the communities, in the countries, et cetera, et cetera. And this has been uh, seen by everyone. So we also, there is, uh, there, there was also a belief and uh, among all of us that, uh, that actually the future all of a sudden becomes, when you look at it, it's young. It is no longer a future of, uh, of the older people somehow. And it is the young people's possession. It is their, uh, their possession. And we have seen even uh, now during the pandemic how youth have been uh, you know, at the forefront. But the most important was in the different meetings that came before 2250 was this intergenerational, intergenerational uh, trust and dynamic that started to, to come together and to show us that with trust, with understanding, with collaboration, this inter, intergenerational work together can bring about something good for youth and something good about youth for the societies and uh, for believing in the energies, the agency, and the dreams and aspirations for a better world. So what we need to do now and to continue to do is to equip more to put more uh, institutional capacity, to bring more funds, to bring more trust, and also to bring a better education for young people and to bring also better economic opportunities so that there would be uh, uh, a brighter, more inclusive present and future for all of us. And uh, thank I think it's, uh, thank you. The last thing I wanna say is just um, making sure that there is space at the table and everywhere else and at every table is extremely important for, for you. And I thank you all very thank much. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for your thoughts. So Jordan, recognizing this leadership, this intergenerational partnership, as you mentioned, and adopted the resolution 2250 with many member states, the membership of the Security Council at that time. And then three years later in 2018, the council adopts another resolution, 2419. Um, and that is um, under the leadership of Sweden and Peru. And of course, the, the rest of the membership of the council. Um, Ambassador Anna Karen, 
uh, what was uh, Sweden's motivation behind being a pin holder of 2419? And how do you think 2419 has changed the landscape for youth peace and security? Thank you, uh, thank you, Jetma. And and uh, this is really an inspiring, uh, inspiring dis discussion. Uh, thank you. I mean, together with with Peru, we took the initiative uh, uh, and initiated the uh, UN Security Council Resolution 2419, recognizing the important role of uh, youth in building sustainable uh, peace. And as we know, it called for the inclusion of young women and men in prevention of armed uh, uh, conflict and resolution of, of conflicts. And I think very importantly, uh, made, make sure that they are actually at the table uh, in peace negotiations agreements. Uh, and this was in line uh, with the conclusions reached in the independent progress study on the youth, peace and security, the missing peace, which was supported by, uh, by my country. And that study drew the attention, as we know, to the true leadership of young people in building peace, uh, that young people through their, their resilience and resourcefulness are often the drivers of social change and political transition, and how critical it is for their true and meaningful uh, inclusion. Uh, another uh, key aspect of the uh, resolution 2419 is that it contributed to the continued institutionalization of the uh, w, uh, YPS agenda. And uh, I think uh, Sima reflected on that as well, how important uh, that is. Uh, and it did so by reaffirming commitments made to uh, resolution 2250, and importantly, by requesting the Secretary General, of course, to submit a report on the implementation uh, of, the, uh, of the resolution. Policies and guidelines are central to institutionalization and to ensuring consensus and broad implementation, uh, ensuring that we all move in the, right, in the right direction. And following up on implementation, including by this kind of reporting is essential uh, to uh, make sure that policies and guidelines are not merely uh, empty world, words, but we actually go to true implementation uh, on the ground. Member states agreement around this resulted in another important uh, uh, milestone earlier this year, the Secretary General's first report uh, on youth, peace and, and security. And of course, as we all know, uh, he there points at remaining challenges in impl implementing the uh, YPS agenda. And just to conclude, uh, uh, I want to underline that Sweden will continue uh, to support efforts to move this agenda forward. And one of these contributions through the Folke Bernadotte Academy uh, uh, is that together with the, the together with your office, Jaya Mata, uh, and the UN and civil society partners mm -hmm. support the development of guidelines for member states for the operationalization of the YPS uh, agenda. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. So in 2018, we adopt the resolution 2419, which calls for a report of the Secretary General. And then this year, 2020, in April, we have the first report of the Secretary General presented to the Council. And the Dominican Republic and France takes leadership now and kind of take the baton from Jordan, from Sweden, from Peru to adopt resolution 2535, which I've heard many young people say it is a very progressive, very action oriented resolution. I want to go to His Excellency Jose Singer to understand what was the motivation behind 2535 and how do you see 2535 influencing the next steps of youth peace and security agenda in the UN and beyond? Ambassador Floisios. Thank you, Jay, for that question. Uh, resolution 2535 brings a wide range of commitment, of new commitments in operationalization of the YPS agenda. But the most important aspect, of course, is how Resolution 2535 cements the agenda in the Security Council once and for all. It is now a regular and ongoing commitment by the Council, including by requesting a biannual reporting by the Secretary General on implementation of the YPS resolution. Beyond, but beyond this, for example, the resolution requests more information and related recommendations on issues of relevance to young people, including on the progress made towards participation of youth in peace processes in thematic and geographic reports and regular thematic and country-specific briefings 
to the council. But it also encourages the development and implementation of policies and programs for youth and to facilitate their engagement, of course, including through dedicated local, national, and regional roadmaps on YPS with sufficient resources, which is very important, and with the monitoring, evaluation, coordination by young people. I must say that Resolution 25 requests further implementation of the YPS agenda in UN operations, including through the development and implementation of context-specific strategies on YPS and to ensure a dedicated capacities with regards with the regards to well the focal with regards to with regards to YPS including designated your focal points of course this is where we think the YPS advisor handbook and the YPS programming handbook came in come in very handy the resolution also brings about better coordination and coherence within the UN system for an effective implementation of the agenda Increasing also the responsibility by the SRSGs and special envoys and re resident coordinators in this respect, and request the UN to redouble their efforts to improve capacity building and technical guidance and to integrate the youth peace and security agenda in the United Nations strategic planning documents, conflict analysis and others. An important achievement of course, by resolution 25 is also that it, it requests the Secretary General to develop a dedicated guidance on the protection of young people, including those who engage with the UN in the context of peace and security. And I would say finally, it requests the Secretary General to ensure that capacities and expertise to engage young people in youth organization, peace building and sustaining peace and programmatic activities are in place for the accelerated implementation of the agenda. All of these policies in order to be operationalized must be developed with a meaningful and full participation of young people and well-defined in the YPS resolution. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Now let me go to Joey. Joey, the member states have spoken about their intentions behind these resolutions and the DSG spoke about the need to bridge the normative conversations in New York with the realities in countries and communities. How has these resolutions impacted your work as a young peace builder and what doors has it opened for you five years later? Yeah. Okay, so... um. The UNSCR 2050 has presented us myriads of opportunities. Um, so um, in Nigeria, um, we, we've witnessed increased participation of youth actors and youth groups on issues. My goodness, that did not happen. Okay. Yes, we can hear there. you. Okay. The video is a little bit slow, but we can hear you very well, Joy. Go ahead. Okay, okay great. Um, so in Nigeria, we've witnessed an increased participation of youth actors and youth groups on issues related to conflict prevention and peace building. On 14th December 2019, the Nigerian Youth for Peace Forum held a meeting alongside um, some stakeholders in partnership with GPAC. And at that meeting, we're discussing on challenges we faced in promoting the YPS agenda. And so we came up with two resolutions. The first was to establish a national coalition on YPS. And the second was to, um, is to document stories of young people building peace across communities. So this document is to serve as empirical evidence on the role of peace actors in Nigeria. And I'm glad to announce that we actually launched the document today. I'm one of the youth organization. Um, you know, but January 2020 met the bet of the Nigerian coalition on YPS. So this coalition is a multi-sectorial platform for youth and non-youth groups working on peace and security. So in the past months as a coalition, we've actively engaged um, stakeholders and the public on matters that are affecting young men and women in achieving the five pillars of the, of the UNSCR 2250. You know, and some of the things we've done in the last months, one of which is um, providing support in drafting the national plan on the UNSCR 2250 um, for the nation. You know, so that's about 90% done. And also, um, during the recent um, NSAS protests, we put out press statements. Part of our recommendation in that press statement was the selection of a 12-man representative across geopolitical zones to dialogue with government on lasting solutions, you know, facing young people. 
um, to lasting solutions on challenges facing young people, right? Um, so as a coalition, we aim to continue advocating for young men and women and to strengthen the YPS agenda in Nigeria. However, we're faced with challenges that have hindered our ability to scale our efforts, right? And so we call on member states and key stakeholders to support the Nigerian coalition on YPS young peace actors across the country with increased technical and financial support that aids our ability to still impact across the country and effectively um, localize, um, advocate for the lo localization of the YPS agenda. In conclusion, I would like to thank the organizers of this event, the UN Youth Envoy and the United Nations for the opportunities that afforded me to represent young people here today. And to especially appreciate the United Nations for its practical commitment to see to the inclusion of young people, you know, on matters related to peace and security. Thank you for seeing young peace builders as partners of peace. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joy, for your words and your partnership as well. Um, you have spoken about how the resolutions have helped you kick down doors, get into rooms, work on the action plans, partner with the government. Um, I want to now go to our membership, uh, member state partner, France, uh, because France is a permanent member of the Security Council. Um, and France will stay in the Council, hopefully for years to come. And we want to hear your thoughts, uh, Diara, as to what will the future of the YPS agenda be on the Council? Now that we have 2535, we will have regular reporting from the Secretary General. In what ways do you think that the Council will be able to advance this agenda? Over to you. Uh, thank you, Jamata. I cannot read the future. What I can talk about is what France um, will do and will commit it. Of course, we will keep promoting the full implementation of resolution on w, uh, Year of Peace and Security and keep strongly advocating uh, for the Security Council to remain seized and committed. Um, I can also assure you that France will call for Year of Engagement in the work of the United Nations, including again the Security Council uh, young people today have shown us that uh, they are ready to be part of the discussion on major global issues. As I said earlier, we see it every day in the mobilization against climate change and the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, France fully supports their involvement in the discussion and decision, uh, which should enable us to address the multiple challenges of today. And Joy cited several uh, of those challenges, and we know that they are not specific to the young people in Nigeria, uh, but are widely shared, unfortunately, around the world. So France will continue to call for the implementation of the WPS agenda throughout the work of the United Nations, both in a headquarter, but also in the field. We call for an holistic and transversal approach, uh, so has the your peace and security is not discussed in silo, but in a cross-cutting manner. Uh, finally, France will put uh, youth at the heart of Equality Generation Forum, as you know, organized jointly with Mexico and UN Women, and which will take place in 2021. Uh, we believe and sincerely believe uh, that youth participation will be crucial and fundamental. This will allow them to participate meaningfully in the discussion and their voices will be heard and has to be heard. Je vous remercie beaucoup pour cette réunion. Thank you very much. I know that this has been quite a long start to our day because we do have two more panels left, but I thought it was really important for us to uh, go back down the memory lane, remind all of us where we are, why we are here, and um, sort of appreciate the strong, constructive, positive partnership that the UN youth organizations, member states, and others have had in this journey. So I thank the panelists of this session very much. And now I introduce to you the moderator of the next session, uh, my colleague, my friend, my sister, Irina Griselli. Irina was the co-author of a paper that my office commissioned last year called We Are Here, 
an integrated approach to youth inclusive peace processes. And today she's going to moderate a panel which says, where are we now? Irena, where are we now? Thank you very much, Jayatma. It is my pleasure uh, to be moderating and an honor to be moderating today's distinguished panel, which will focus around a discussion on the implementation of the youth peace and security agenda, including where progress has been made and where challenges remain. Please allow me to introduce our distingu uh, distinguished speakers. We have with us Mr. Hao Liang Chu, Assistant Secretary General and Assistant Administrator and Director of the Bureau for Policy and Program Support for the United Nations Development Program. Mr. Oscar Fernandez Taranco, Assistant Secretary General for Peacebuilding Support Office of the United Nations Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs. Mr. Mohamed Yaya Kwani, Kani, apologies, Youth Representative from the United Nations Association of Afghanistan. Ms. Odera Christine Acheng, Youth Representative from the Horn of Africa Youth Network, and Mr. Sven Erik Söder, Director General of the Volker Bernadette Academy. I would now like to welcome and invite all speakers to join the panel and turn on your cameras, please. Distinguished speakers, you have all been working on implementing the YPS agenda at a global, regional, and country level. There have, of course, been many highlights and lessons learned in this journey of moving the YPS agenda forward, and we'll focus on this during our discussion. In the interest of time, we'll have one round of questions and a kind reminder to all panelists that the speaking time will be four minutes. And as Jayatma mentioned, I will be graciously interrupting when the time comes to a close. So to begin, Christine, from the perspective of a young peace builder, could you share some highlights in the implementation of the YPS agenda with a focus of some examples that you have seen of good practice and lessons learned at a country and regional implementation level? Over to you, Christine, you have the floor for four minutes. Thank you. Excellencies, distinguished guests, fellow youth leaders, healthy youth, peace and security day. The key milestones of the youth peace and security agenda in the East and Horn of Africa member states are, one, translation of the resolution 2250 infographic into Kiswahili to establish and progressive report um, mechanism. Secondly, we created the, Eastern, the East Africa Youth Empowerment Forum on Youth Peace and Security and continued interest in the region to domesticate um, the youth peace and security agenda in inclusive domestic laws and policies, including youth policies that we experienced here in Kenya. We've also um, seen the willingness of a lot of civil society organizations to support young people in uh, youth peace and security and the continued case of organizations working with youth peace and security issues to interact and associate with international organizations. On the examples of good practice, the African Union Youth Peace and Security Framework, which mandated the creation of Youth for Peace programs, the creation of Youth Envoy Office, our great IR Chebi, and Peace Ambassadors. Indeed, the African Union has been the only regional body that has domesticated the Youth Peace and Security agenda with a regional ambassadors. About the lesson learned on country levels, protection must be prioritized on every youth engagement and participation. At all levels of peace processes, civic engagement, politically and at local communities, there is need to reach and include youth in their diversity because youth are not a homogeneous lot. Finally, your excellencies, Despite the progress primarily led by young people, there's an increased need for political, political buy-in for the youth peace and security agenda at the government level. Many government leaders struggle to understand the importance of youth peace and security agenda or struggle to embrace and act on it. It requires a seismic shift in attitudes and perceptions of the capacities of young people in the eyes and hearts of our older government leaders. I thank you. Thank you very much, Christine, for those reflections. 
I would now like to give the floor to ASG Hao Liang Chu. If you could share with us from the perspective of the United Nations, what are some of the key highlights you have seen, good practices and lessons learned in the implementation of the YPS agenda, perhaps focusing on partnerships? Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Irina. Uh, dear young leaders, uh, excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me uh, first uh, acknowledge uh, the permanent mission of Sweden and the youth envoy, as well as all other co-conveners for gathering us here today. It is an honor for UNDP to co-host co -host this important high-level event. I think I would like to use uh, one example that we uh, have been uh, implementing uh, as a as you know an example. You know. So as a key milestone, I would like to highlight is, is the first UNDP global youth program called the Youth GPS that was launched in 2016, soon after the adoption of the resolution 2215, and which includes an explicit focus on youth, peace, and security. And uh, the program is articulated around both a multi-dimensional and multi-level approach in recognition, in recognition of the many levels and the contexts in which UNDP operates. Uh, the UNDP Youth Global Program has already mobilized the interest and support from a broader range of donors and partners from Sweden uh, to Denmark, from Norway to Italy and to Mexico, and helped inform member states' priorities and strategic responses. The program has also forged new partnerships with youth organizations, movements, and networks, and advocated for such partnerships to become a criterion for the allocation of funding under UNDP's funding windows. And since 2016, we have leveraged UNDP's larger global network of, of practitioners to support and collaborate with over 100 field offices, for example, in Sierra Leone, in Jamaica, and in Pakistan. And this program has also enabled the co-hosting of an unprecedented use peace and security consultation uh, in 2017 in the context of, and as a follow-up to the missing peace in uh, progress study. And, uh, and also under this program, we have implemented the first phase of the 16 by 16 initiative by which UNDP supports and promotes the role young leaders play in advancing SDG 16 in 16 countries. And the last thing, but not least, you know, uh, we have been able to convene an online global knowledge platform called the useforpeace.info, which is uh, being upgraded and relaunched today as a YPS one-stop shop, you know, uh, a, a, a knowledge platform. So I think this is what I would like to uh, highlight. Now, uh, very quickly, three lessons learned. I think it's important the first to reflect on. Uh, one is, uh, you know, young people, you know, uh, we find you know, uh, are still often, you know, uh, superficially taken into account in institutional and the context analysis of fragility and the conflict assessments. We hope that uh, the UN YPS programming uh, high handbook will be a help, will be very useful, you know, in addressing this issue. The second lesson, you know, we believe that more comprehensive use and SDG 16 plus projects and the programs are urgently needed with an, an emphasis on youth participation as decision makers and on uh, safe you know, spaces uh, for youth. And thirdly, having the ability to access and deploy capacities to the field is a key to having an impact. We have recently launched uh, the first roster of pre-vetted youth consultants and have initiated a partnership with FBA, uh, whose director general will also speak you know, now, to deploy YPS secondees, starting with the UNDP country office in Ukraine, right? And uh, just to end, you know, with an uh, example of you know uh, learning from the lessons, you know, and in the context of the peace, you know, uh, process uh, in Colombia, you know, the UNDP Manos a la Paz, you know, MAP initiative has placed more than 1,200 young leaders in local municipalities thereby strengthening local governance capacities for peace and increasing the engagement of young professionals in service delivery in the post and the most conflict affected areas. 
So let me take the opportunity to thank UNPBF, our bilateral donors, and the youth partners for this support. We look forward to continuing our joint effort for more systematic support to youth leadership to sustain peace. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ASG Haolong Chu. I appreciate your reflections and highlights. Now, while a lot of uh, progress has been made on the implementation of the YPS agenda, as we know, there are still gaps and challenges that remain in the operationalization of the YPS agenda. Assistant Secretary General Fernandez Taranco, from your view, could you share some reflections and highlights in this journey? And particularly, what are some of the key challenges that have been faced in the implementation of the YPS agenda? You have the floor for four minutes. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Let me, um, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, also uh, with my good friend, uh, ASG Hao Liang, to thank the governments of Sweden, Dominican Republic, France, and Jordan, the Special Envoy, and all the UN colleagues and civil society and youth partners that are joining us today to celebrate the fifth anniversary of 2250. Um, we're very, very proud to have been uh, part of this movement from the very, very beginning. And let me just before on the gaps on the progress, because I think it's, it's extremely important to contextualize so that we can address the, the, the gaps. Um, the first report of the Secretary General on Youth Peace and Security actually articulated the growing recognition of young people's essential role in peace and security and many instances in which governments, UN, civil society actors and others are stepping up to implement Security Council Resolution 2250. On the part of the UN, we increasingly see the mission and UN team-wide approaches to youth peace and security, a strong support from the leadership of the UN, the commitment of the youth focal points and the dedicated programmatic funding and partnerships with young people. Uh, as the DSG mentioned earlier, the UN field missions are taking practical steps actually to help young peace builders overcome the barriers to participation, multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination and marginalization, and again, including by creating opportunities for meaningful participation and building stronger ties between young people and decision makers. PBSO is also supporting the Peace Building Commission in its efforts to underscore the role that young people play throughout its work in support to national peace building priorities. And the, as, as others have referred to, the Peace Building Fund has a dedicated gender and youth promotion initiative, which in itself is the largest funding initiative in support of youth peace and security. And this year we will be investing some $37 million worth in projects that are being implemented by UN agencies and I think uh, a, a quite a track record of new innovation implemented also by civil society partners around the world. Um, so you asked about the gaps um, and I think many of them are articulated uh, in the 2020 report of the Secretary General. Um, the core challenges that remain uh, are very well identified and, and where we need to um, accelerate the implementation of this agenda. So. Uh, first of all, the fact that there are barriers to participation of youth, I think many of the previous speakers already uh, referred to it, the structural barriers that limit the participation of young people and their capacity to influence decision making. Um, I think it's extremely important that, this, uh, that, that we see uh, the fact that there's been insufficient financing uh, in terms of facilitating the inclusion and empowerment of young people. And this is particularly true now uh, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic as young people are seeking ways to support one another and to demand and drive changes. Um, the Security Council Resolution 2535 is very action focused and actually asks the member states, regional sub-regional organizations, the UN, et cetera, to provide better guidance and reporting in our efforts to mainstream the youth peace and security into the work of the UN. Um, all of this work is only possible, and I think this is maybe one of the biggest challenges, uh, with adequate, predictable, and sustained finance, uh, financing. This is very clearly articulated in the SG's report, and possibly the biggest challenge we, we face in, uh, in terms of uh, inclusion of young people, empowerment of young people, and particularly in funding the small, local, youth-led efforts to build and sustain peace. 
Um, we, through the Peace Building Fund and working very closely with UNDP, UNFPA, UN Women, for example, are trying to fill this gap, but clearly it is not enough and much more needs to be done. Um, so let me, let me end at that. I know we have very little time, but thank you for this opportunity to participate. Thank you very much, ASG Fernandez Taranco, for sharing those concrete examples and challenges that remain. Now, uh, one of the examples that we have in terms of overcoming some of these challenges has been the deployment of youth peace and security advisors to UN field missions. So, Mr. Sven Erik Söder, could you please share from your view some of the key moments in the implementation of the YPS agenda and elaborate on why the Folke Bernadotte Academy considers the deployment of YPS advisors to be an important strategy in the implementation of the YPS agenda. You have the floor for four minutes. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Irina, for giving me this opportunity to, um, to answer your question and also to address this really important uh, subject. Um, and frankly speaking, uh, personally, I consider the YPS agenda to be one of the most important UN agendas in terms of uh, building sustainable, uh, sustainable global future. It's a really, really an important agenda. Uh, and as always, you know, real progress and change is depending on actions and on practical day-to-day -day work. So we'll try to be as practical and operational as possible during my four minutes. Uh, and talking about the Folke Bant Academy, I think really we have a unique possibility of bridging the gap between YPS policy and practice, since we work, you know, both at the global level with many different key stakeholders like the United Nations, but at the same time, we are also working at the country levels, you know, and we are targeting national decision makers and young peace builders directly for our different bilateral uh, projects. Uh, and just to give you a few examples, we have, uh, for example, organized uh, joint learning forums when we have bringing, bring together, brought together YPS practitioners to share experiences and to discuss how to replicate good practices and take them to scale. And some of those experiences, they have also been included into the two handbooks that we're going to launch later here today together with our partners. Uh, we have also contributed to building capacity through training of the UN staff in Somalia, for example, on how to design and deliver better YPS programming and how to integrate the comprehensive youth perspective into analysis and, and policies. And currently, we're also working together with the UNSSC with a purpose to develop global YPS training that will strengthen institutional capacity worldwide. And, uh, I'm also happy to, to mention that tomorrow we are going to, uh, to launch the Iraqi Coalition and Youth Peace and Security Initiative in, in Baghdad, together with our partners in, in Iraq, uh, the Iraqi government, the Kurdish regional government and UNFPA. And that's also a very practical example on how we are working uh, on the ground. Finally, you, you put a question on uh, on secondments and um, uh, with all respect, you know, for resolutions and policies, they're of course critical. But uh, at the end of the day, I think uh, real change has to do with people and, and practice. So uh, from our side as an implementing government agency in Sweden, we are really, really happy to announce that we have now seconded our first YPS advisor to the UN. Uh, uh, a colleague seconded to Unsom. Uh, in Somalia, and he will be there uh, from the beginning of January. And we're also right now in the process to recruit a uh, YPS expert to UNDP in, in, uh, in, in Ukraine. So um, I think the most important we can do in order to take this really, really important agenda forward and try to fill the gap the best we can is to be as practical and as operational as possible. That's our experiences so far. Thank you very much, Mr. Sven Edix. I appreciate those remarks. Um, so to conclude, I would like to invite uh, Yahya to share some thoughts around what are some of the concrete initiatives and measures that key actors, including the UN, member states, and supporting institutions could put in place looking forward in the next five years to further support youth-led peace building. Thank you, Yahya. 
thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let me um, thank the office of UN Youth Envoy, um, Sweden Mission, um, as well as uh, Dominican Republic and French government, and um, also um, the UNDP, UNFPA, um, Jordan Mission for organizing and making this um, uh, panel happen. So um, I want to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of um, the participants and attendees. Uh, coming to your question, I want to, um, first of all, say that uh, the UN Resolution uh, 2250 was a milestone. It was um, a concrete uh, guideline for uh, member states, for the non-governmental organizations and for youth activists around the world upon which they can deliver solutions in new and better ways. As an evidence, I can mention National Youth Consensus for Peace in Afghanistan. Uh, that's a movement of 244 organizations uh, or 2000 plus uh, individuals who came together for meaningful inclusion of youth in the Afghan peace process. Uh, the Afghan peace process uh, started two years ago and uh, with the hope to end uh, the two decades conflict through negotiations. In our country, uh, more than 70% of the population are youth under the age of 25. 90% of security forces are youth and 95% of the insurgents are youth. Uh, the question is, if young people fight in the front lines for peace, if they are working for peace in the community, why there is no space for them to talk for the peace? This mass exclusion of youth is not only in Afghanistan, it's in all over uh, the conflicted, armed, conflicted countries because these youth have the majority of contribution in building peace and strengthening uh, their country's democracy and community, but there is no space for them uh, to take action. So based on our activities um, in, the, in our country, in the National Youth Consensus for Peace, uh, we had uh, different resolutions. We had provincial resolutions from youth from different provinces who shared their views, recommendations, and demands for their inclusion and their points of concern to the government. Uh, the, the thing we found is that we have resolutions, we have the support of international community like the resolution 2250 uh, for inclusion of youth, and we have young peace builders who are committed and who are working hardly for their inclusion and they are using that energy in a positive way. But the challenge is that the governments are not supportive in this case. And for this, we have certain recommendations, as you asked. Uh, what we found and what we recommend is, first of all, uh, the United Nations can build national mechanisms, like uh, and mechanisms and national labels. This uh, resolution 2250 or other resolutions, they're abroad and the situation is different in each country. So UN nations in different countries working with the governments, including young people and young peace builders, that can be a great thing. Because in the resolution, we said, what should we done uh, and what should be done for youth? But the question remains how we can include them. There is no specific mechanism in our country. And I'm sure this lack of mechanism is an important one. The other thing is putting the agenda uh, this youth peace and security, if not a top priority, but we can have it close to the top priority. That's important because uh, we can have more attention. We can encourage the governments to take action. The other thing is about um, uh, protection of young peace builders. In our country, we are doing different things. We are advocating, we are, we are uh, organizing events, but we are not certain what we do, what we say, if we have any future, if we have, if we are protected, whether it's physically or um, with protection legally, because uh, a few days ago, there was a massive attack in Kabul University where youth were studying. They had nothing to do with the politics or other things. There have been so many attacks on youth in the past um, month on, uh, in Afghanistan. Um, whether they were, they were peace builders, they were activists or anyone else. So this protection shall be considered. And uh, we urge the United Nations to do that 
uh, and support the governments to do so. And the last thing is supporting uh, and amplifying the voice of youth by highlighting their activities and amplifying their voice. You can give the power to youth and with the support of the United Nations and international organizations, we can have them on the floor to have more efficient and um, impactful um, um, achievements in the community. Uh, once again, thank you I very much. Thank you very much for you. Thank you very much, Yahya, for these uh, frank remarks and uh, reflections. And I would like to take a moment to extend a, a heartfelt thank you to all the distinguished panelists today uh, for sharing these very important reflections and, and practical experiences around the progress and, and still where the challenges in the implementation of the YPS agenda lay. If I can now kindly ask the panelists to turn off their cameras as we close this discussion. And moving forward, what these reflections all highlight is that there is still a need for international actors, including the United Nations, to continue strengthening institutional capacity on the YPS agenda. It is therefore with great, great honor and pleasure uh, that I announce that there will be now a launch of two new handbooks aimed at supporting the UN, regional organizations, civil society, and other important key actors in furthering the YPS agenda. For this, I'm delighted to give the floor to ASG Fernandez Taranco. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, ladies and uh, gentlemen, it is my pleasure to launch the Youth Peace and Security Programming Handbook on behalf of the United Nations Population Fund, the United Nations Development Program, and my own office, the Peacebuilding Support Office of the Department of Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, with the generous support and technical expertise of the Volker Bernadotte Academy. I thank UN colleagues, including the task force of UN entities represented at the global, regional, and country levels, and our partners. My particular thanks to Director General Sven Erik Solde and his team, without whose support this would not have come to be. The Youth Peace and Security Programming Handbook is a testament to our joint commitment to drive forward the Youth Peace and Security Agenda as a central component of the UN's work for and with youth, and the core decision of our work to support national efforts to build and sustain peace. The handbook builds on the momentum gathered around the trio of Security Council resolutions, commencing with the 2250 that we celebrate today and responds to the call in resolution 2535 to ensure full, effective, meaningful participation of youth without discrimination of any kind. This participation is key to advancing peace building processes and objectives that take into account the needs of all segments of society. The handbook is an essential contribution to the operational readiness and capacity of practitioners to implement the youth peace and security agenda. It builds on existing guidance and lessons learned from the UN and partner organizations and draws on the findings and recommendations from the missing piece, the independent progress study on youth peace and security. It fills gaps and responds to priorities identified by young people and partners in a concrete and user-friendly way. The handbook is intended to be used by country, regional and global teams in the United Nations systems, but it can also support field practitioners beyond the UN, including other international, regional, or sub-regional organizations, national counterparts, youth-led and youth-focused organizations, movements and networks, and peace-building organizations. Importantly, it addresses in particular the need for meaningful engagement of young women and men in all stages of the programming process. I know that many will benefit from this guidance in their work going forward. You will find the full handbook available on the uh, Youth for Peace webpage next week, which is up in the screen. And we look forward to detailed discussions on its context and lessons in the new year. And I thank you very much for participating in today's launch. Thank you very much, SG Fernandez Taranco.
It is now with pleasure that I give the floor to Erika from the FBA to continue this launch. Thank you. Thank you and good morning, good evening, uh, everyone. Um, it is a great pleasure to jump in for my director general as his computer just crashed uh, a minute ago. And as a co-author of the YPS program, uh, uh, one of the contributors to the programming handbook, as well as the co-author of the advisory handbook, I'm happy to uh, jump in in his place. And it takes really a village, it seems, not only to raise a child, but really to develop a handbook. And I would deeply like to thank our partners, DPPA, PBSO, UNFPA and UNDP for the fruitful collaboration in developing the YPS programming handbook. And we are truly looking forward to continue this collaboration in future joint ventures. But FBA is also proud to take this opportunity to launch our Youth Peace and Security Advisors Handbook which we think will be an excellent complement to the programming handbook. The overall objective of the handbook is to enhance the effectiveness and the impact of the work of IPS advisors. More simply put, to help them to do their job. Our expectation is that this handbook will better enable YPS advisors to contribute to the operational readiness of their organizations to accelerate the implementation of the YPS agenda in diverse contexts. The handbook will support the work of YPS professionals and focal points working at global, regional and national levels. Its advice builds on interviews and discussions with former and current youth peace security practitioners within the UN, the EU, the OSCE and FBA. The handbook provides a comprehensive outline of the core tasks and functions associated with the role of the YPS advisors. It offers recommendations, examples and points of departure, from which those professionals can support the organizations to develop appropriate actions and approaches to realize the YPS agenda. Just to mention a few examples, the handbook provides guidance on how to deal with resistance, how to advise on youth peace and security related matters, building and strengthening institutional capacity and how to lead strategic planning processes. So we are happy to, uh, to launch this handbook and you will be able to retrieve it from now on the FBA website. YPS advisors are constantly baking new grounds uh, and exciting and challenging grounds. And with this handbook, we aim to extend a supporting hand to these professionals and to be a practical go-to reference for anyone who chooses to work with YPS wherever they decide to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ereke, uh, SG Oscar. Uh, I know the DG couldn't uh, join to this particular segment, but many thanks to him and, and your entire teams as well. And congratulations on another key milestone for further advancing the YPS agenda. I'm sure the two handbooks will undoubtedly be resourceful to all the colleagues who are trying to work on the YPS agenda or are already working on the YPS agenda or have aspirations to work on the YPS agenda in their own um, institutions. Um, with that, I want to move on to our third and last panel. And Erike, let me invite you back again to moderate this segment of our program. Thank you, Yayatma, for that. So once again, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. And uh, my name is Erike Tanghoi, and I work as a Youth Peace and Security Specialist at the Folker Bernadotte Academy. And it is a pleasure to welcome you all to this third panel today on the institutionalization of the YPS agenda. In our previous panels, we have heard our distinguished guests highlighting the many things that we have been achieving so far, and the different efforts uh, that have been taken to move the agenda from policy into practice. And what a fantastic journey it has been. There is no question that we have a lot to celebrate today. But today is also an important moment for us to reflect. It is an opportunity to look back and try to extract lessons and assess what worked and what didn't. But it's also a crucial moment to look ahead and to build on those experiences and to determine how can we move forward more efficiently in realizing the objectives of the YPS agenda. 
I'm therefore very excited to moderate our next and final panel, as we will have the opportunity to discuss with knowledgeable people who are directly working on youth peace and security related matters. I am grateful to have in our panel, uh, Mr. Alessandro Prefti, who is the Director of Reincorporation at the UN Verification Mission in Colombia, which is one of the UN missions that is pioneering YPS implementation. We have with us Mrs. Lynn Rose Jane D. Hannon, a young peace builder from the Philippines. Lynn Rose is a member of the Executive Committee of the Young Women Leaders for Peace in the Philippines. We have also Mrs. Susanna Dakash, uh, the Youth Peace and Security Specialist at UNDP Istanbul, the YPS um, Istanbul, the, sorry, UNDP Istanbul Regional Hub. Uh, and Susanna is working to support the implementation of the YPS agenda with country offices in Europe and Central Asia. And lastly, but not least, we have with us Mrs. Fatuma Mohammed, the program officer and team leader for youth and innovation at UNFK Somalia, where she also is the co-chair of the UN Interagency Working Group on Youth. A big and warm welcome to you all. And with that, I would like to invite all of you to put on your cameras. During this panel, I hope that we together will be able to identify some concrete uh, recommendations on what is needed in order to accelerate the implementation uh, of the agenda and to strengthen the institutionalization of the YPS principles and practices at all levels. So to start our discussions, I would like to turn to you, Mr. Pretty. The UN verification mission in Colombia has been in the forefront of implementing the YPS agenda. The mission has designed a YPS strategy set up a network of youth peace and security focal points and has officially incorporated YPS section as part of the periodic re reports provided to the Security Council. So as a director of reincorporation, what is according to you the importance of integrating and mainstreaming YPS language into official mandates? And how does it help to accelerate implementation in the ground? Uh, thank you, first of all, on behalf of the SRSG Carlos Ruiz Massier, I would like to thank Sweden, France, Jordan, Dominican Republic, uh, the Secretary General's Envoy on Youth and the Folk Bernadotte Academy for the organization of this important event. Um, before answering the question, I would like to mention some elements of the Colombian context. In Colombia, 30% of the Colombian population are youth, more than 14 million people. 33% of, of the 8 million of victims of the armed conflict are young people. And uh, unfortunately, after the sign of the peace agreement, continue being recruited and victimized by different armed groups. And among FARC former combatants, 22% are young people. Uh, but young people have not been only the victims of the war, they have also become key actors in peace building. And in these days, thousands of young people participate with their testimonies and proposals in spaces su such as the Truth Commission, the National Council for Peace, uh, carrying a clear message. We never again want to see the horrors of recruitment, sexual violence and destruction of our families and community. Now, let's go to your question. Uh, uh, re regarding the importance of integrating and mainstreaming uh, YPS language into official mandate. In the UN verification mission in Colombia, we are very proud of the work we have done over the three years with our YPS strategy, uh, trying to include um, within uh, the UN verification mandate uh, the uh, uh, YPS uh, agenda, and especially related to the two areas of the peace agreement, uh, the reintegration of former combatants and the security guarantees for communities. How our mainstreaming strategy is coherent with the resolution 2535 and, and it, is, it is based on three elements. First, uh, uh, a mission-wide strategy on uh, YPS has been designed in consultation with the youth organization. And this strategy takes into account the pillars of the resolution 2215 on participation, protection, prevention, partnership and reintegration. Second, the mission strategy is focused on supporting the work of regional youth focal points. We have one focal point in each regional office of the mission uh, that have established permanent dialogue with the youth organization and young leaders. 
And third, uh, immediately after the 2419 resolutions in 2018, the mission has reported regularly on uh, YPS issues in every quarterly Secretary General report in Colombia. Reporting on YPS has been important to keep Security, Security Council members informed about issues affecting youth in Colombia. And during one of the Security Council session about Colombia in April 2020, a youth representative was invited to present his point of view on peace implementation. I think that this mainstreaming strategy has contributed to accelerate implementation on the ground uh, because uh, we are trying to take into account the basic recommendation of the independent progress studies on uh, YPS, the missing piece. Uh, we can summarize the recommendation about the three P's, people's capacities, participation, and partnership. First of all, strengthening young people's capacity, especially at territorial level. Secondly, overcoming politi political and economic exclusion, promoting youth participation in peace and security. And finally, trying to build partnerships where young people are empowered and viewed as equal and essential partners for peace. Thank you. Thank you, Director Alessandro, and thank you for your support to the implementation of the agenda. In fact, having the support of the managerial level do make a big difference in the ground. And talking about support on the ground, I would like to jump right into our next panelist, Ms. Lynn Rose Jane D. Hannon from the Philippines. Lynn Rose, you have been actively working with youth organizations in the Philippines and internationally, championing peace building and climate action. And you probably have many experiences of partnering and closely collaborating with international organizations like the UN. If I may ask, in your opinion, what would you say is crucial in order for international organizations such as the UN to effectively support the work that you do? Hi, happy fifth YPS anniversary to everyone. I am Lina Rose Hennon, and it's my pleasure to represent a network of young women leaders and allies for peace in the Philippines under the Young Women Leaders for Peace program of the Global Network of Women Peace Builders in this very, very important conversation. So in the Philippines, I work with young people who are actively engaged in sustaining peace in the local communities. And one of the roadblocks in scaling up existing youth-led initiatives is access to opportunities of funding and resources. Most of the youth-led networks making the YPS agenda tangible and real in the lives of young people in the communities work with meager resources and taps mainly on volunteer labor. So I think what we need from the international organization is first, provide accessible funding and resources, putting the money where the work is. One road, roadblock, for, for instance, for fund access for informal youth networks like ours in the Philippines is legal registration or license. In our country, we have to go through a tedious and lengthy process to get registration. But peace cannot wait. Our work in the community can, cannot wait. So despite the meager resources, we have to persist and maximize our leadership capital as a network. We we're able to access funds and resources through the global network of women peace builders and through partnering with institutions and organizations that our members are affiliated with. So given this reality, I think it is imperative that we need to make funding policies and requirements inclusive to formal and informal youth-led organizations. At present, youth-led networks are already disadvantaged in terms of legal structure, years of experience, and to most, if not all, level of influence. Some youth-led organizations in our country, for instance, don't even have access to the internet where most funding opportunities are disseminated. The second thing is, I think, is to trust young leaders through creating mechanisms to work with youth organizations and networks as meaningful partners. We need to allow young women and men and members of the LGBTQIA plus community to be in charge and be meaningfully, me meaningfully included in the implementation of the YPS agenda in a more holistic approach. And I also think that this must be coupled with capacity building. For example, capacity building programs of our network through the mentorship of GNWP enhance the skills of our members in designing programs, writing project proposals, implementing and monitoring and monitoring and evaluations of our programs. We want to be partners for peace where there is meaningful partnership, increased ownership, and where more sustainable peace is possible. And the third and last thing that I would say is recognizing that youth is a diverse group and youth have diverse vulnerabilities. And COVID-19 and the climate crisis has exacerbated that. For instance, stereotypes around gender and age 
can cause invisibilization of young women, which leads to their ex exclusion. When you're a woman and you're young, you have different experiences and needs and you're disproportionately affected by the social challenges in your community. So I think for international organizations such as the UN to effectively support the work that we do, we need to be immersive, we need to be connective, we need to be inclusive, and we need to be sustainable. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn Rose, for all that. And I do think we all can agree that while we know the importance of working for youth, we still have a way to go to improve the different ways we work with youth. And I think that is a good link to our next two panelists, as they both been championing meaningful youth participation at the UN and seeking ways to better partner with youth organizations at the national regional levels. So I would like to start uh, with you, Susanna. You are working as a youth business security specialist at UNDP Istanbul Regional Hub. And I'm curious to hear your experience when it comes to engaging and partnering with young people and youth organization at the regional level. For instance, is there a role for young people in the different analytical work that you do? And do you have any good practices that you could share with us on how you have done that? Thank you, Erike. And uh, greetings participants and fellow speakers. And thank you to our hosts and organizers for inviting me to this very interesting panel. Definitely, to answer your question, Erike, there is a role for young women and men to participate in analytical work that we do as UNDP, but also as the UN system as a whole. Uh, if you think about uh, the peace building strategies and programs that we do, conflict analyses and assessments are central ways in which we build them. In practice, this means which stakeholders are mentioned and included in these types of analyses and which are omitted has serious implications for how we understand the context and how we set our priorities. So this is why it's really crucial not to disregard or uh, exclude the agency of young people or to overlook how conflict might impact young people differently. And the best way to ensure young people's inclusion is to work with young people directly. Um, I can highlight uh, a few quick points or good practices based on the work that we do in Europe and Central Asia region as the UNDP Istanbul hub and specifically in the Western Balkans as part of a joint UN project funded by the Peace Building Fund. Um, the first point that I would like to make is that it's important to acknowledge that when it comes to youth, we easily slip into assumptions that, and we need to really counter that with hard data. So it's important to be uh, acknowledge uh, that, that gap that we have. For example, in the Western Bal Balkans, there's a lot of speculation around whether the new generation born after the conflicts of the 1990s that has no memory of peaceful coexistence prior to it is more hardened in its identity lines and the views of the other, or if this generation could be more inclined to move beyond the past and build sustainable peace. So with this kind of uncertainty of where young people stand in this issue, we saw that this was a serious gap in knowledge, which we need to bridge so as not to risk assuming, but actually building the youth peace programming in the region on evidence. And so the study that we designed to dis is uh, designed to discover the perceptions of youth about the past, the issues that unite or divide different segments of young people, and to put the youth perspective uh, into envisaging potential scenarios for the region. The second point I'd like to make is that I really recommend collaboration with local youth organizations whether, whenever you can or we can. For example, we're partnering with the Regional Youth Cooperation Office who have in their mandate to strengthen reconciliation and exchanges among youth. And this gives us completely different networks and audiences than if we remain within our, U our UN sphere. But also we wanted to go beyond that and engage young people in the entire process. And that's why we invited a youth advisory group representing the region and coming from different backgrounds and different experiences to work very closely with us to design the research and be part of the analysis and validation. So that really is doable. It requires a lot of coordination and a lot of effort, but I think in that sense, we really feel that they are co-leading and advocating for the results of the study eventually and in the dialogues and launch events that are upcoming. My third point is that when, um, to define data collection analysis and research topics with the youth. So it's interesting to notice that despite the regional nature of our project, when we work together to identify the main topics to be included in the study, the points of interest and grievances were common. And we have also seen that the very process of designing the study together serves for the young people as a means of dialogue among themselves. 
And hopefully when we get the results of this study, we believe that this will be also a first step towards bridging the gap between young people and decision makers as well. And as a final point uh, into this uh, introduction on how to engage young people into analysis and how to institutionalize young people's role into uh, programming uh, by our own actions. I think one thing that is important to remember is that youth is not a homogeneous group. So whether we're doing programming or as in this case, in this example, uh, analytical work, we really need to take care to reflect the voices of those who are marginalized, rural youth, those not in school or employment, minorities, not to forget to reflect on the different experiences of young women and young men. And we need to really be aware about the sensitivities about who can represent who when doing analytical or programmatic work. So I'll conclude with that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susanna, for sharing these experience, recommendations and reflections. And what about you, Fatuma? In your work with UNFPA in Somalia, is there a role for young people in programming? And what has your key lessons been so far when it comes to partnering with young women and men? Uh, thank you, Erika, for having me and um, dignitaries, fellow speakers, colleagues, and the amazing young people joining from everywhere. Good evening. Uh, definitely for me, yes, there's, there's a role for, for young people at each and every steps uh, of a project or whatever we are doing in YPS. And we need to, like, meaningful participation of young men and women is, is key. So first of all, because it's their right, uh, but also strategically speaking, the yeah, engagement in the design, planning and implementation actually help our, our programs to be more relevant and effective. When we include, you know, young people in project design or planning phase, we are able to get more, you know, comprehensive uh, picture of the context. We get the nuances and the reality on the ground. And more than anything, we can uh, better understand you know, their specific needs. We can understand their unique experiences, the challenges they face, and we can also learn about uh, their aspirations and the visions uh, for their community. So it's very, particularly very important for, for fragile contexts like ours in Somalia, where young people constitute a significant portion of the, of the population. And uh, we believe a, com a good and comprehensive analysis, like which reflects the unique perspective of young men and women, uh, often led leads to better programming and will increase the likelihood of greater impacts and results. Integrating the views uh, and needs in the planning stage is crucial, but that is not all the young people want. Young people want you know, more engagement. They want to have a say in what's going on. They want the opinions to be taken into account. What happens is you consult young people and that's it. Maybe you don't even take their, their, their opinions into account, but that's not what they want. They want shared decision-making. They want to feel ownership and they want true partnership. And, uh, and as organizations, I need, we, we need to walk the talk and ensure that we, 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 we increase our effort in, in making sure that we establish true partnership with youth organization and enable young people to be involved in the program implementation. In a country like Somalia, partnering with youth-led organizations uh, is crucial because uh, it ensures actually that the implementation takes place. In Somalia's case, you know, we are lucky, for example, that we have partnership with youth-led organization called YPIA and other youth-led organizations. They have a presence across the federal member states. And we want organizations like that, that have the kind of presence, access, and, and often better understanding of the con context on the ground than, than we do usually. And, and they're actually, young people are very effective in mobilizing their peers and the community at large. And uh, people usually argue, they will say, oh, uh, you know, building the capacity of youth organization, especially in fragile con context is, is too cost costly. But uh, I think my personal experience is the opposite because in the long term, uh, we, we find that from an efficiency and value for money perspective, uh, meaningful youth participation is also very, very good investment. Um, you will initially definitely build the capacities, uh, you know, develop their skills, their financial capacity and professionalize their work. But in the end, 
you know you get you you it's 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 a smart investment and thank um, you fatuma for sharing these experiences and for reminding us that the importance yeah. of involving young people throughout the programming cycle um being a little bit mindful of our time um i would like to proceed uh, in the panel but for me, I mean, listening to, to all of your answers, it's clear that all of your organizations have started to embrace the YPS agenda and that you are truly realizing it through various initiatives. But I want to be a little bit more critical here because we know that although a lot has happened over the last five years, a lot remains to be done before young women and men of different backgrounds have equal access to decision-making and have their positive contributions to peace building processes recognized. So with the risk of being a little bit provocative here, I really would like to pick all of your, pick your brains uh, to figure out what needs to be done to ensure that the implementation of the YPS agenda is not only translated into siloed youth initiatives, but actually becomes an integral part of everyday operations, practices and behaviors in organizations like yours. Mm -hmm. um, so from your individual perspectives, um, in very short points, um, I would like to ask you, how can we ensure that institutions like our own become meaningful partners to youth? And what are the key factors contributing to the institutionalization of the YPF agenda within organizations? And I would like to start here actually with you, Susanna, to hear a little bit about your reflection on this. Thank you. Um, well, that's quite a good question in terms of how to summarize it to key points. I think one thing that has come across already quite a few times uh, today in previous interventions was the, our role for just speaking in terms of UNDP or UN, our role as a convener. So we have the capacity to bring together a variety of stakeholders and to have uh, young people there to amplify young people's voice among different stakeholders is one thing that is within our powers. And I think that is one fir first place where to, where to start. Um, that is sort of our role to mitigate the limitations that young people have in terms of participation and, and bringing their points through into various platforms and, and fora and uh, their participation in discussions and consultations. In terms of uh, how, to, how to increase young people's participate or how to mainstream the YPS agenda into our own work, I think that really starts with having dedicated capacity, having um, dedicated time and, and increasing the awareness and interaction between also UN staff themselves and different youth actors, whether we're talking about youth organizations, regional, national or local organizations, or we're talking about um, having partnerships with different, even new types of youth actors that are, that are acting in very uh, flowing and new types of ways. One final point that I would like to make is I think that also, and this is something that has come across in the analysis work, that we have done. It is important that we also are conscious of our role and obligation to ensure that whenever we do work with young people and whenever we do engage with uh, youth actors in whatever process, anal analysis or um, programming, it's important that we do not expose them to harm, that we do realize that, for example, let's say conflict analysis can raise alarm or resistance among different stakeholders. So it's really important that we also, when engaging with young people, are also conscious of our role in, in protecting and ensuring the rights of young people. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. And from the perspective of the senior management level, what are your thoughts on this, Mr. Prati, regarding um, key uh, factors for the institutionalization of the YPS agenda and for becoming a meaningful partner to youth? Uh, thank you. Is for me. Thank you. Yes, please. I think that there are, I think that there are three or four key factors for the institutionalization of the YPS agenda. 
capacity, resources, and good practices. I would add something like imagination and innovation as well. First of all, um, strengthening the capacities, in, in our case, of all mission personnel. No? All staff receive training, especially in the induction process on the YPS agenda. There is a specific section on youth included in the mission verification manual. There are periodic meetings of the youth focal points with the SRSG and the leadership of the mission to update the implementation of the strategy. Secondly, um, resources, uh, uh, the availability of resources. The mission does not have the mandate to contribute directly to the implementation of the piece. Our mandate is only on verification and good offices, but we have the possibility to use extra budgetary funds to support quick impact projects. And with these resources, we, we have been uh, able to promote activities such as uh, cultural and sport projects, community and sustainable development activities, uh, promotion of political dialogue between the youth of different political parties, um, spaces of dialogue and reconciliation with, between young former combatants and young leaders of the communities. Um, the third point is the identification and vis visibility of good practices uh, in a coordinated strategy with uh, our youth focal points and communication focal points and uh, with an effective use of social media we always try to strengthen and demonstrate good practices of economic and political empowerment uh, where the protagonists are young people and young peace builders. Uh, some initiatives that caught the attention of national and international media are related to, for example, the rafting project in Miravalle, Caquetá, the ecotourism initiative, Hidden Paradise in Meseta Uribe Meta. And for final point, uh, thinking out of the box, we be innovative, be, be creative, uh, be like uh, dreamers. I remember a meeting with young Colombians in a recent national meeting called by the Fruit Commission, where they claim the right to dream, stating that even though uh, the right to dream is not included in the Universal, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, dreaming is the source of all rights because it allows us to imagine and build another possible world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Pretty. Turning, coming back to you, Fatuma. Um, what would you like to add to the discussion? How are you working with institutionalization uh, in Somalia? Uh, thank you, Rike. I think uh, I can name three concrete things that uh, helped us uh, speed up the implementation of YPS. One of them was to move away from, uh, you know, ad hoc initiative and prioritize the creation of sustainable mechanism for youth participation. For example, we had um, we have established a UN Youth Advisory Board, uh, which is a diverse group of, of young people, young men and women who are advising the UN for a period of two years uh, on programs and policies. And uh, also district uh, youth councils were also some of the other mechanisms that we have established. Secondly, new funding streams really helped us speed up YPS implementation. And I want to thank uh, Peace Building Fund Youth Promotion Initiative. At the beginning, we were really struggling but um, when um, in 2017, when we had this uh, youth promotion initiative, we had uh, a project that we initiated on youth political participation in three districts, Kismayu, Dolo, and Baidawa. And it was in collaboration with UN Habitat, ourselves, UNFPA, youth organizations, and the government. And I, we can say that uh, that has really speed up uh, so much. And uh, um, we can say that we got very It seems like we just lost Fatuba. So thank you. I will uh, then turn to you, Lynn Rose. Are you with us again, Fatuba? Erika, can you hear me? Yes, now I can hear you loud and yes, clear. Yes, yes. So I, I will just conclude. Yes. Yeah, I'll just conclude. The third thing was uh, so funding stream was the second thing. And the third thing was to have a dedicated capacity uh, at the RC office, you know, helping all of us, you know, and implement, uh, uh, put pieces together and, and implement YPS uh, agenda. And so, and I had earlier this, there will be a dedicated capacity on YPS and I'm sure, you know, that will, will, will further help us uh, do much more than, than we have done. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Fatuma, for that. Um, now we'll, I want to turn to you, Lynn Rose, being a young peace builder. What do you think from your perspective that you and needs to have in place uh, to become a relevant partner to you and the organizations that you are uh, working with? I think I would sum up my points, uh, you know, like in resonance of what has been brought earlier with my fellow speakers, but I will start with ownership. Like, you know, like working in local communities, we still have so much to do with awareness campaigns and the agenda in itself, making it the household agenda. On ownership of the agenda starts with the awareness awareness that it exists. And I also, I also think that there's a need to mainstream and localize it in the academia and the non-formal education spaces, and even translate the agenda in local languages. We have been doing online infographic materials about YPS, but we also need to keep in mind that not all young people have access to digital spaces. In most cases, the young people who have less access to information about this agenda are the, ve the very reason why this agenda is crafted in the first place. The second, I agree with Susanna that, you know, like protection. Protection is crucial in ensuring that youth become meaningful partners in, institu in the institutionalization of YPS. And I think this calls, calls for strong mechanisms of human rights protection for youth peace builders. In the Philippines, there lacks a strong human rights protection mechanism for young peace builders against state intimidation and red tagging. A strong mechanism for human rights protection is a requisite to continue with the work that we do. And the last thing I think is you know, the power of collective voice and linking it to the existing structures. Tapping into the power of collective voice is also key. Working with existing peace organizations, creating national coalitions, um, help us in expanding the reach of the YPS. I think we also need to look into the existing windows of engagement where we have opportunities for mainstreaming the YPS agenda. What we do in our network, for example, we integrate YPS in our individual works. Uh, for example, for me, I work in a university and I teach fundamentals of peace education course, and that, that is where we integrate the YPS and WPS. And also we have members that are um, elected officials in the youth councils. And also we see that as an opportunity to work with established structures in the Philippines for the inclusion of YPS in their youth development plan with allocated funding. So this ensures that it is localized, it's practical and it's sustainable. So thank you. Thank you, Lynn Rose, and thank all of you. And I think you have raised very valuable aspects. And I, I would like to echo the importance of walking the talk and by including the YPS language and principles in the official mandates of organizations and to ensure the support of YPS from the senior management, allocating resources, dedicating capacity, but also be creative and dare to dream a bit. With that, uh, I would now like to invite some um, practitioners and peace builders uh, that have joined us online uh, to pose some of their questions to the panelists. And I see that we already have got uh, some questions. Um, and the first one relates to dealing or navigating with resistance. So this person is working in the field, uh, very passionate about YPS, so am I. Um, and this person would like his organization to do more, but it feels like the agenda is not having a priority of his management. Sometimes it feels like they have even be a bit resistant to the idea. Do you have an experience with this? Are the tips you could share about how to navigate resistance on YPS? I think this is a very interesting question. And I actually want to bounce that directly to you, Susanna. Have you any experience of dealing as a youth insecurity expert? Have you had experience of dealing with resistance within your organization? Thanks. Um, it's a very interesting question. I wouldn't really frame it so much as resistance, but uh, referring back to what Lynn Rose said about awareness. So I think there, there is room for increasing awareness about what is the YPS agenda? What are the commitments that we have as an international community and that member states have in terms of um, implementing the YPS agenda? And why is it in place in the first place? So it is not about, perhaps there might be uh, misconceptions when we have the words youth, peace and security, that this is now something a little bit threatening or something uh, that can be destabilizing. Whereas we're really talking about an agenda that is about inclusion, about participation for positive development for sustainable peace. So I think that by raising awareness, 
by engaging, like I mentioned before, um, people from within the organization as well with youth and having uh, that interaction directly where, where staff and, and those who are implementing projects and management who are making decisions actually see who are the youth actors on the ground, what do they think, what are, they, what are their opinions about the current situation in their societies. I think that's really fruitful and I've seen that in the discussions that we've had in different country offices and the, the results have always been positive in the sense that this has inspired um, management level also to engage more on YPS and to include it in its programming. So I think it's interaction and raising awareness. These would be the, the key things to do. Thank you, Susanna. And I want to mount a question to you as well, Rinroes. Being a young peace builder, what are your experience of dealing with resistance and how have you dealt with that? I think I agree with the Susanna that's more of a resistance, it's lack of awareness. And I think also um, when we hear another, you know, like framework, the youth peace and security, people would, the misconception that it's an added work. But uh, I think what we what we do like in our in our network is we use the space that we already have. Like as I mentioned earlier, when I, I shared that we have members who are part of the local councils. So we look into how do we integrate uh, to make sure that the YPS agenda is integrated in their programming. Another thing is we have members who are part of the Bangsamoro Transition Authority, and they have the space already, and how do we maximize that space and to integrate YPS in the work that we are already doing. Another thing is we do community youth discussions and we provide this space for dialogue and maybe uh, engage more with, with people who are a bit resistant or maybe not aware of the agenda yet, especially in the top management, you know, like, um, uh, uh, positions and and also like um inform uh, you know like this dialogue uh, clarify misconceptions and open spaces for collaboration um actually and another thing is that when our government doesn't listen to us the power of collective voice and coalitions is i think is very very useful in in um, effective uh, communication and effective messaging so yeah thank you lynn rose for that we also got a couple of questions relating to COVID-19 and how the response to the pandemic uh, affects young people's um, possibility to organize and to participate in decision making and in, in peace building, given the increased restrictions uh, of civic space. Uh, and I think I would be curious to hear a little bit from you, Ms. Pretty. how has the COVID-19 affected uh, youth in Colombia and how have you as uh, the mission worked um, to adapt to, to the restrictions that has been um, put on by the response? Um, yes, the impact has been very strong as in the other parts of the world. As you know, Colombia is one of the, probably one of the 10 countries with a more uh, COVID-19 affected population. Um, the basic restriction has been to movements, so for us it has been very difficult to reach uh, young leaders and former combatants all around the, the, the country. But anyway, we have started to work uh, really uh, online and uh, to work with the information technology and to improve uh, uh, connectivity all around the, the, the country. Um, with technology, young people are very clever and open-minded. So uh, where there is the possibility, uh, it has been for them uh, a chance to participate actively actively in, um, in, um, in the definition and implementation of peace in the territories. And I think that uh, the new normal uh, will offer some bigger opportunity and challenges for the future. We hope, we all hope that uh, 2021 will be the, 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 the year of recovery, but, um, but at the same time, um, we're working on uh, improve uh, participation of young leaders in all the spaces uh, that we have. Thank you so much for your answer, Mr. Pretty. A last question that we got from our audience regards on what we can do to support the participation of young women in particular. And I would like to give you, Fatuma, this question. How have you, in the context of Somalia, worked to ensure young women's participation in, in your programs and projects and in the peace building processes? 
Uh, thank you, Erika. I think um, Somalia is, is actually a very conservative country and uh, women, women participation, young women participation are not really valued. But uh, in our own experience, what we do is that we demand young girls or women to be on the table. So if you, if you have any activity, if you're doing any capacity building, you really have to be forceful to make sure that there are young women there, you know, and if necessary, you need to put seriously as one of the, of the results in, in, in any projects that you're doing to have certain percentage, whether it's 50-50 or something like that. And you really have to be forceful about that because there will always be, you know, resistance. Um, you might even get, uh, you know, a training room full of young men absolutely not considering any women and um, we have issues with you know young women uh, sitting on uh, uh, those mechanisms that we talked about for example when we were establishing the UN Youth Advisory Board we had to do special consideration to have equal number of young women in, in, in that so I'll say just be forceful just be deliberate just make sure that you know young women are there and demand for it thank you Thank you, Fatuma, and all of you for your very excellent uh, answers to these questions. We have reached the end of our panel, and we are unfortunately running out of time. And I think we had a very interesting discussion. And one of the key messages that I bring with me from this is that YPS is already happening. And it's youth that are in the forefront of its realization that are driving the agenda forward and implementing it and localizing it. As to the institutionalization, I would just like to want to make the remark that it is truly everyone's responsibility to make YPS lasting and an integral part of overall organizations, mandates and operations. With that remark, I want to thank all of our panelists one last time for their participation and commitment. I think we have learned a lot from you. I also want to thank all of you watching and engaging online. Thank you. Thank you very much, Erike. What an insightful discussion that was. Uh, thank you to all the panelists and also to our audience who've been asking these great questions um, and, and really sharing your experiences with us. Thank you very much for your active engagement. So as Erika said, we've now come to the end of our um, celebration and forward-looking um, elements of our meeting today. And to wrap things up, I want to invite the formidable Dr. Natalia Kanem, who is the executive director of UNFPA. And many of you know that UNFPA and PBSO have been really anchoring this agenda and have been leading this uh, on the side of the UN and bringing us all together. So I'm, it's my honor to give the floor now to Dr. Kanem. Natalia. Well, thank you so much, Jayathma, for your outstanding leadership. Thank you, Erika, for moderating a fascinating set of conversations. Thanks to PBSO and all the organizers. Excellencies, distinguished guests, youth leaders, dear colleagues, dear friends, happy birthday, Resolution 2250. Today, we've celebrated this milestone of the world's common journey towards sustainable peace, towards a world where the voices of young people are heard, heeded, amplified, and shape the agenda for the better. Five years old, Security Council Resolution 2250 is leaving the infancy stage. Many of you know I'm a pediatrician. <laughs> and now moving into the critical juncture of a moment where it can fully run on its own. What we see is the promise of how this resolution has galvanized young people to make a difference on the ground where it counts. And this growing contribution to the peace process can be a formidable thing. Whether it's for an adolescent girl in a war-torn country, she's desperate to stay in school. We can help. The young woman in a refugee camp who fears daily for her safety or a human rights activist who's forced to flee his home, they all, have an equal right to a brighter future. 
and Resolution 2250, working hand in hand with Resolution 1325 on women, peace and security are both made stronger, I believe, because young women especially have proven to be critical strategists. They're stepping up to lead peace building efforts and they deserve full support as leaders, as equals, as change makers. 2250, of course, is also part and parcel of Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Peace Agenda, which calls into question established power structures and governance systems. It does. This conversation is helping the global family to imagine how we move faster to shared common goals. And as the embodiment of leaving no one behind, Resolution 2250 embraces leadership of all young people. I've been so impressed that you do this irrespective of age, sex, gender, uh, sexual orientation, ethnicity, religious affiliation. 2250 is celebrating the power and the agency of young people as peace builders. It celebrates your courage as young human rights activists to stand up for the inclusive future that you're demanding. And you have a lot of support from many of us. As you've heard, UNFPA has had the privilege of standing with young people, working hand in hand with you to support your leadership directly. We've also partnered with civil society, with member states, with the United, with the United Nations system as a whole. And faith-based organizations and so many others that are devoted to the principle of peace, which is the very cornerstone of the United Nations Charter. UNFPA and all of us have a role to play in shaping a human rights-based, evidence-informed, gender-inclusive youth peace and security agenda. Our work obviously is not yet done. We've had astute comments and questions today, and it's important that we keep to together to shape a positive narrative, encourage inclusive peace building processes and make sustainable investments in young people's education and young people's employment. We've heard today that the operationalization of the youth peace and security agenda is the key priority for the next five years. And you can count on us to play our part. We're stepping up our engagement at every level I'm particularly proud of our collaboration with the Folky Bernadotte Academy, with UNDP, with the Peace Building Support Office in developing the handbook, the Youth Peace and Security Programming hand Handbook, which will make an important contribution, especially at the country level. That's where the inclusive YPS programming makes a difference. So just closing with a huge thanks to all the speakers today. You've given us valuable insights into the vi vision of the future that you hold and also the how of the practicalities of the youth peace and security agenda. Even with COVID, we cannot stop, we must not falter, we go forward. So let's commit to amplifying the voices of young people, to listening to their demands, to supporting their energy, their ideas, and their strategy for a more prosperous future for themselves, which means for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, Natalia. Um, thank you for your words. Thank you for your partnership. And I think you, you really hit the nail on the head when you say we need to address the inequalities that we are seeing through the COVID-19 pandemic. And we know that inequalities are a driver of conflict. They are the root causes of conflict. And by resolving those inequalities and addressing those inequalities, we do help create a peaceful environment and a sustainable world, not just for us today, but for the young people and the future generations as well. Thank you very much for your reflections. Colleagues, it's been a true pleasure to take stock of the YPS journey so far. It's been really also emotional to hear all the stories from five years ago, this journey that we have all come together with the leadership of the formidable young peace builders who are risking their lives every day in the front lines to reflect and to look to the future. 
this journey has only begun as as we would say and i really look forward to continuing advancing this agenda in partnership with all of you uh, i wanted to note that next year the folke bernadet academy will be launching a yps policy brief based on today's conversations and uh, next year my office also together with all the partners who are involved in this uh, meeting and uh, governments of qatar colombia and finland will be convening a high level conference on youth inclusive peace processes in Doha in May next year. So uh, uh, advance invitation to all of you to help continue this journey and partner with us in these next steps. Finally, I want to thank all the panelists, all the moderators, the participants for joining today. Special thanks to our co-host, the Government of Sweden and the Folke Barnadet Academy. Uh, FBA uh, was kind enough to reach out to the UN proposing for this initiative and I'm very thankful for that partnership for that initiative and really bringing all of us together to celebrate this important milestone so thank you erica thank you joao thank you everyone at fba I also wanted to thank uh, the, the mission of Sweden in New York, Ambassador Kiki, everyone there. Thank you for uh, acting so effectively and efficiently and pulling all of this together. And thank you for your partnership. Uh, thank you also to our partners, the governments of Jordan, Dominican Republic and France, who have really been our biggest allies. We also look forward to our new allies in the Security Council, Ireland, Norway, Mexico, Kenya, picking up this baton and really taking the YPS agenda forward in the coming two years um, and most of all our UN partners UNFPA DPPA and UNDP I want to give a special shout out to colleagues like Cecile Noelia Marie Ducey Chelsea Payne Ruth Bello who have really been the heroes behind the scenes and have been pushing this agenda have been pushing all of us um, who might not appear on the screens but are really supporting us and holding our feet uh, under under the fire fire under our feet uh, so my team as well uh, emilia maria buga everyone gizem thank you very much to all the support and pulling this together thank you very much colleagues uh, i really look forward to continuing this conversation and working together with all of you to translate the various resolutions that we spoke about today into concrete action that support young people take good care and stay safe